Hello everyone and welcome back for more biotechnology. So in the last video we discussed the ELISA assay and specifically we focused on its use of antibodies. Well this video is going to focus on the western blot which isn't going to be too much of a far cry from what we talked about with the ELISA because we are going to see some similar concepts and very similar usage of antibody at play here. So what Western blotting actually is, is an optional step that can be taken after you've already run an SDS page gel. So it's kind of a pre-requirement. You have to have proteins in a gel before you can do a Western blot. So you'll recall that SDS page, what it does is it separates proteins based on their size in terms of how many amino acids there are. But even once you've done that, it can be fairly difficult to pinpoint, either qualitatively or quantitatively, a particular protein in that gel, since there can be such a thing as proteins that have the same molecular weight, just different amino acid composition. So even if you've got an SDS page gel and you've stained it with Kumasi, even if you see a really big band that pops up where you expect your protein to migrate in the gel, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're looking at your protein of interest. So that's what a Western blot is all about. So similar to the ELISA, the Western blot utilizes both primary and secondary antibodies to bind to a protein of interest and then illuminate it with an enzyme that is conjugated to one of the antibodies. So what you might be wondering is why is this called a Western blot? Was it developed in California? Was it developed uh, uh, while someone was wa watching a Western on TV? Well, here's the origin of why it's called a Western blot. A very similar technique uh, for detecting specific DNA molecules was invented by the gentleman that you see here, uh, and his name was Edwin Southern. So uh, basically what people did is they just uh, altered his t southern blot technique to detect things other than DNA molecules. Western blotting is basically just clever wordplay here. So if the southern blot is for DNA, the western blot is for proteins. And then similarly, the northern blot is for RNA molecules. So there is no Johnny Western, there is no... Uh, other real story about why this is called the Western blot other than it's just clever wordplay over uh, uh, Edwin Southern inventing the Southern blot. So the Western blot is called that just to kind of play off of the Southern blot. Okay, so we've already said that the first thing that you have to do for Western blot is you've got to run an SDS page gel. So once you've done that, and once you've separated your proteins based on your size, the next step is to transfer the proteins from the gel matrix they are in, from that polyacrylamide, uh, onto a membrane that binds proteins. So the reason why this step is necessary is because the antibodies, if they're going to detect proteins, they have to actually find the proteins and the proteins are stuck inside the gel and the antibodies are not going to get through the gel. So we are going to basically use electrophoresis to pull those proteins out of the gel and stick them onto a membrane that is sticky for proteins. So this transfer is going to utilize an electrical current to pull those negatively charged proteins and keep in mind, these proteins are still negatively charged because they are bound to SDS, the detergent that makes them be negative. And this causes the proteins to then stick to the membrane in the same orientation that they were in the gel. So basically we are just pulling the proteins out of the gel and we are sticking them at the same spots on the membrane that they were in the gel. So they should still be separated based on their size. And this protein uh, binding membrane comes in several different varieties. The two most common are either nitrocellulose or PVDF, our two most common protein binding membranes. So when you are doing this transfer, uh, you set up what's called a sandwich. So you'll see why here in just a second. So basically we are going to use a big plastic cassette and we are going to basically stack a whole bunch of stuff, stuff on top of each other and then place it in this cassette. So the order of operation here is that if this is our sandwich, the bread of the sandwich are just these little uh, blotting pads. They don't really serve a whole lot of purpose other than to kind of form the outer part of the sandwich. Uh, 
Then on the inner part of that, so if anything's gonna be the cheese here, it will be filter paper, basically just allowing us to use something to place our membrane and our gel on. And then the innermost part of the sandwich is the most, par is the most important part. On one side, we have the polyacrylamide uh, gel electrophoresis gel uh, with our protein samples in it. And then on top of that, we place our transfer membrane. So we basically just overlay the membrane on top of the gel. And then we need to make sure everything is oriented here so that the current goes in this direction here. So since our proteins in the gel are negatively charged, they are going to migrate towards the positive electrodes. So they're going to migrate in this direction here, which is what we want, because we want them to get stuck on the membrane there. And as you can imagine, you want to make sure that you don't do any of this backwards, because if you, up, uh, if you load this stuff upside down, then uh, instead of migrating towards the membrane, the proteins will instead migrate towards the filter paper, and at that point, uh, the whole thing is uh, bunk at that point, and you'll have to start over. So here's some pictures that should give you a little bit of a better idea of what the transfer actually looks like. Uh, so this is what's called a wet transfer, which is the by far the most common type of transfer, in which you have kind of a Pyrex dish filled with a transfer buffer. Uh, that has uh, methanol and SDS in it. Uh, so what you're seeing here is this plastic cassette in which we are constructing our sandwich. So you can see kind of this blotting pad here. And uh, as you go further down, you'll see the filter paper, the gel, and the membrane as well. So once we have our sandwich constructed, we stick the cassette into this rig that is going to provide our electric current for us. And that is going to pull the proteins in the membrane in this direction towards the red electrode uh, from the gel onto the membrane. Okay, so after this transfer is done, you should be able to discard the gel. So there should be nothing left in the gel, no proteins left in the gel. Every, all of those proteins should be stuck onto the membrane now. So. The next thing that we want to do is we want to utilize our antibodies, right? So we've got the proteins on the membrane, but what we're going to want to do here is we want to add our, pro add our antibodies so that they bind to particular proteins on the membrane. But there is a problem that we need to think about here. Antibodies are proteins themselves and the membrane that we're dealing with binds to proteins. So the problem we run into is that since antibodies are proteins themselves, they, at this point, if we don't do anything else, they will get stuck to the membrane themselves instead of actually binding to their antigen. So that's gonna be a problem. So that is why before we start thinking about antibodies, our next step is to block the membrane with a solution that contains protein. Your book mentions a solution of bovine serum albumin, which would work perfectly well, but oftentimes the cheapest and one of the most effective things to do is to just use milk. Milk contains a lot of proteins that will bind to any unoccupied spots on the membrane, meaning any spots on the membrane in which protein did not previously bind to. So those proteins will lay on top of the membrane and those proteins will stick to any unoccupied spots meaning that by the time we actually add our antibody, our primary antibody, it can no longer bind to the membrane because all of the spots are blocked. So the only way it can actually stick is if it binds to our protein of interest. So we didn't really mention it, but this type of blocking step is also necessary in, a, in an ELISA assay, because if you don't do that in an ELISA assay, the antibody can get stuck to the bottom of the well as well. No pun intended. Okay, so now that the membrane has been blocked, the next steps that we're gonna talk about are virtually identical to what we talked about with ELISA. So the blot will then be incubated with a solution that contains the primary antibody. And as we've said, this antibody will recognize and bind to our target protein of interest. So of all the proteins that were in the SDS page gel, our antibody should only detect one particular type of protein. And it should also not detect any of the milk proteins either.
So once we have allowed our primary antibody to lay on top of the membrane for a while, we will wash off any unbound primary antibodies, and then next we're going to add our secondary antibody. So our secondary antibody should recognize the constant region of the primary antibody, so that's the way you're actually looking at it in this picture. And then, as we've said before, the secondary antibody should be conjugated to an enzyme that will produce either light or color when we add a particular substrate. So that should all sound very, very, very familiar to what we talked about with ELISA. And just as the case was with ELISA, you also have the option of doing a direct Western blot in which the enzyme that is conjugated is actually on the primary antibody, which cuts out the need for a secondary antibody. But also, in the same vein, you run into the same downside of doing this, possibly losing strength and specificity from your primary antibody if you choose to conjugate an enzyme to it. So let's talk about these enzymes. The two most common conjugate enzymes that you can attach to antibodies are horseradish peroxidase and alkaline phosphatase. They both e uh, work equally well. So the idea is that after the secondary antibody step and after you wash away all the unbound secondary antibodies, addition of the correct substrate to the blot will start to cause these enzymes to produce light, which is a reaction called enhanced chemiluminescence, or ECL. So bands within the blot that are producing light are going to be the ones that have antibody attached to it. So if you, after adding the substrate, if you immediately go to a dark room and you expose the blot to film, you can uh, basically get a physical record of the blot that you can keep for pr pretty much forever. So in this picture that you're looking at here, you are looking at a scan of an auto radiography film piece in which a Western blot was done. So in each particular lane of the SDS page gel, you can see particular proteins lighting up here. So this must be an antibody against a protein that uh, has uh, some similarities with larger proteins, which is why you're seeing multiple bands here. And then you'll notice some of these bands are actually wider or fatter or skinnier or thinner than others. The idea is that the density of each band is meant to represent the concentration of that particular protein in a sample. So much the same way that some ELISA assays could be quantitative, you can get a certain amount of quantitative information out of a Western blot as well. All right, so that is going to do it for this video on Western blocks, hopefully, uh, Western blots, excuse me. So hopefully you found it useful and hopefully you learned a little something. So join us for one more video in this chapter and we will start talking about natural products in biotechnology. Thanks as always for your attention and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.